Hey, Santa Grover here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another science fiction topic. We're going to be talking about writing in particular. Now, just to give you some context or some background, I've been reading a lot of science fiction in the last few months. I've been reading things like the Foundation Trilogy, among many other short stories by Isaac Asimov. And I've currently picked up some short stories based on, or written by rather, the writer Frederick Pohl. And I'm just thoroughly enjoying this fiction, especially, you know, fiction of the classic 1950s. It's got a specific tone. It's got some character. It's got some provocative ideas. And I'm really enjoying that classical setting, that classical sci-fi set setting. Now, that said, I really do want to be a little bit more balanced with my reading fiction in that I would like to read more recently, you know, published books. You know, something that's been published in the last five to ten years or even more recent than that. And so I had remembered that I had a space fantasy novel or really I would categorize it as a science fiction. Well, yeah, science fiction, but really space opera. That That's the category uh, specifically. And it was, it's was it been on my Kindle for the last four years. And I remember reading the prologue and being very intrigued by the prologue. The setting was right. It was like, yeah, this is a little bit of a sci-fi space fantasy vibe paying homage to star wars and maybe some earlier classics influencing star wars and i liked the feel of the setting so i reread the prologue just a few weeks ago and i'm like yeah let me give this novel a shot and i gave it a shot and i was very disappointed with it it's about one out of five stars for different reasons that i will get to in a moment now, before I do, I will mention that I'm not going to mention the writer. I'm not going to mention his name. I'm not going to mention the book title. This is an independent author. I'd like to respect that. I'd like to see him succeed, and I wish him the best for all subsequent novels. I think he's on book three, probably writing book three of his series. And I think this universe actually is going to be, from what I heard, I think he's going to be one of many writers expanding this universe that really is a Star Wars galactical vibe. So, you know, all power to him. I hope he does very well. Maybe he will improve on his writing as he goes. Um, but I, it just was not my cup of tea. But also, I, I think it's fair to say that it was terribly written. So if you are curious what this book is, you can totally you know, send me an email. I'll refer the book to you that way, but I'm not going to refer to it on this channel because I, I really would like to be respectful to this independent writer. Now, why I would give it one out of five stars, I would say it has to do with a few things. The first thing has to do with the hero, the, the protagonist of the story. He, unfortunately, is absolutely a Gary Stu. He is competent in everything, and I mean everything, even things that he doesn't have to do. Even things, you know, even roles he doesn't have to play. Like he has an AI companion and she does a lot of things for him, like pilot his ship. <laughs> but apparently he knows how to maneuver and pilot the ship and all that. And he he's very much competent in things that he really shouldn't be uh, based on his vocation. And so not only is he competent, not only does the reader see he's so good at everything, we see it constantly affirmed. There's affirmation after affirmation, whether it's characters directly telling him how good he is or other characters talking amongst themselves, referring to how good he is, how how they shouldn't underestimate him if, if we're talking about the villains specifically. So there's that. He's a Gary Stu in that way. He's constantly, well, I would say the writer is constantly trying to endear us to him, you know, endear the reader to him. And he's just good. He is a, a very pure heart, a very good heart. Now, that's fine that you can work with that. You know, we have something like that with the likes of Luke Skywalker. Unfortunately, this guy, this, this Gary Stu protagonist, he has the heart of gold like Luke Skywalker, but he doesn't have the naivete or the inexperience. He's, he's not an inexperienced man. He's, I think... I think he's in his 40s at least, maybe maybe just approaching 40, and his vocation is very much the same as Han Solo. He talks like Han Solo, he dresses like Han Solo, he's just got that swagger. And he even has the same vocation as Han Solo. He is a smuggler, 
And he's actually also a mercenary. And so he's involved with a lot of illegal activity. And there's no mention of the empire or an empire. Uh, there's nothing, there's no tyranny mentioned. It's just, you know, planets having these, you know, three or four kingdoms. There's no emphasis on a tyrannical rule until much later that actually doesn't amount to anything because the, the evil scheming king is stopped. So there's no empire where he would, you know, have that, that role to, you know, to perform illegal activity and still stick with a moral code. He is just, he's got it right. He's, he, he knows the right thing to do. He's always known the right thing to do, and he will do the right thing no matter what. He's got the old heroics. But that said, he's more Han Solo. He's got the mercenary and, and the smuggling background, so he, he does illegal activity. Uh, he, he's also, if, if that's not enough, he's also an ex-elite military sol soldier. Uh, so he's got insane capable fighting skills. And, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's from this really brutal upbringing. I mean, so brutal, in fact, it's like, why, why would you have so much compassion? Why would you have so much, uh, so much of a good nature if, if you have so much of this background? And on top of that, he has a very strange... I would say slightly off-putting uh, romantic relationship with a, a princess who has brown hair, just like Princess Leia. Uh, fortunately, Princess Leia, or this princess doesn't act like Princess Leia. She's her own woman. She's got her own personality. It's not much of a personality. But the two immediately fall in love. Okay, that's fine. But it's highly emphasized in this book that he has never touched a woman. If you got the background of Han Solo and doing nefarious illegal activity like smuggling— and first of all, why are you smuggling if there's really no empire? You know, why don't you just pick up another job? I mean, maybe you're on the run, but come on, uh, you could pick up another job. Uh, you know, so he has he has all of that, but he's never you know been in love. He's never been with a, another woman and another relationship and all of that. And not until he meets this princess, and he's probably like you know forty years old and stuff like that. Um, so all that out of the way, he's completely good and pure, even with his Han Solo vibe and, and vocation and all of that. So we've got the Gary Stu hero. Now we have the villains, um, and they were really problematic as well. Um, they were very one-dimensional evil, and I think that's fine, actually. I, I really do miss that evil, being evil for evil's sake. And the, it, I would say it could have worked, um, and it was a little cartoonish, and that's okay. I, I don't really mind the cartoonish evil as well. The problem was that the two main bad guys, the two main villains, especially the the main villain, um, he was stupid. He was he was just not clever, and that is very incongruent with his vocation. Uh, he's the king's advisor. He's an evil scheming advisor to an evil scheming king. Uh, so you've got a king. He's got to be smart, and then you've got this advisor. He's got to be smart too. But they were both very, very presumptuous, and they, by presumptuous, I mean they were weighing out none of the outcomes to stop this protagonist, to stop this hero. They, they just assumed the best. They didn't see uh, through all of their plan. They didn't investigate. You know, they didn't go back and, and, and comb through all the little details. They're like, eh, that's probably going to work. Eh, that's probably the case. And because of that, the hero survives. You know, the hero's... <laughs> You know, on top of the, the the main villains, you know, they're they're military, uh, they're they're soldiers, completely incompetent, completely incompetent. Even the the advisor villain, he 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 says as much as like, well, why are these people incompetent? Why are you incompetent? And it's it's trying to make the hero look good, but unfortunately, the hero who's supposed to like outsmart everyone and outrun everyone, he actually doesn't do very smart things. The reason he could get away is because the villains are very dumb. They, they just don't think things through, and it's very infuriating. So you've got the overly competent hero, and then you've got the very stupid villains. I, I just wish there was just a little bit of a, a balancing out where, where the hero is um, struggling and where the villains really actually pose a, a risk, a, a major risk. Now, if perchance someone knows about the book that I'm talking about, maybe the writer himself, he says, wait a second, wait a second. 
they torture this hero. They torture. It's, it's an absolutely torturous scene. He will not reveal the location of his beloved princess. And so they put him through all sorts of shock. They, they actually bring a, an interrogation doctor. And even the reader, it's so gruesome that the reader doesn't see all that's happened. But uh, basically, after the torturous scene, the hero is just a bag of bones on the floor, absolutely broken. But somehow he has like a working arm and he hoists himself up. On, on onto the interrogation table, and then uh, and then he crawls, uh, kind of in in a kind of lame form, in a lame way. He he staggers over to the the evil scheming king and spits in his face. So apparently he wasn't that broken, but no, actually, the novel reveals that his body was absolutely broken. There's even at this one point where he's sitting on the interrogation table. Just, just popping his fingers, his broken fingers, like all just you know splayed and, and and disjointed and stuff. And there's this point where he's popping his fingers back into place in front of them. And and at one point, I thought he was superhuman. I thought he was part machine because I was like, e- e- is there any is, is is there any indication? Is there something external about this guy that we don't know that 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 this guy doesn't know that makes him so special? I thought he was superhuman, but it turns out a few chapters later, I did. It, it was confirmed that he is totally human, totally just like you and me, just very strong, very, very much a, an elite soldier, a capable fighter. But <laughs> the, the 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 torture should have broken him, um, if not physically, mentally, um, as as it was confirmed by the villains themselves. Uh, so there is that. And this actually leads me to this next point why I just really couldn't get into this story all the way. The hero feels like a stranger the whole time. He feels like a a side character, like it's not really his story. And the reason for that is, yeah, there's action, there's fighting, there's fleeing, there's all sorts of stuff. And he, he interacts with different characters. But we don't really see what he's thinking. We don't get into the interiority of this character. And I think that's really, really important. Without it, I'd, I'm not sure if he's supposed to be conflicted with something. Like, for instance, how, why isn't he conflicted with being so pure with, with his nefarious smuggling job? Um, why, why is he so abnormal in that he has not touched a woman all these years, but he has that roguish you know, suave nature, like instantly, you know, the princess is instantly attracted to him. He's not had any relationship. And you know what? If if he's atypical in that regard, I kind of want to see why. I want to see if he's questioning himself. Why, why is he abnormal in this sense? And um, as well as the, the torture scene, it's kind of weird because I did see that he was in pain. I knew he his, his body was going into absolute shock. He was he was you know twitching and he's you could see that he's writhing in pain and even so I did not feel his pain if that makes sense he just kind of went through the torture and then the the advisor helps him you know escape for for some some you know under some pretext uh, get you know give him some med packs give him some water give him some food and and basically he's flying a ship just totally fine you know totally healed and stuff like that, which was kind of weird. But in the torture scene, I didn't see his psychology screaming, like his brain and his mind screaming. I didn't I didn't feel his pain. And it might be sounding a little sadistic that I would want that as a reader, but the point is he was just kind of going through the torture scene and then moving on to the next thing. That's actually very much what his character is. He's He's the same man that you see him right at the first page all the way to the final sacrifice. He, he even sacrifices his life, and he's, he's the same with no real conflict. He's always resolved, which I need conflict. I mean, even with an, you know, some, someone who is aspirational like Luke Skywalker, I need conflict. He, he just he moves from one big thing to the – excuse me, there's the, the microphone. He moves from – one big thing to the next. And and there's no real consequence, not even emotionally, not even psychologically, and I want consequence. And so um, th- there was that. There was no interiority. There was absolutely no inner conflict. He, he feels moody about something, or he feels sad about something, or he feels very solemn about something, but I don't see why. I don't see why. 
So I needed some interiority. I needed some, you know, inner space and, you know, inner, you know, mode of thinking, some sort of mode of thinking. So I understand this character. Without it, he was the main character, but he felt like a stranger the whole time. And then finally, on top of being so confident and having it be confirmed and reaffirmed that he does the right thing no matter what, okay, I get it. He makes the ultimate sacrifice. And then in this kind of threshold between life and death, he's given the chance to live again, to be with his princess. And to, to the spirit before him, who was um, a, a, an ancestor of the first galactic knight, the, the galactic knight, you know, calls him a hero. And then this main hero says, I'm no hero. I'm just a hired gun. And I'm like, that kind of false humility drives me up the wall. I, I, I think, you know what, if, if he would have acknowledged the, the heroics of another person, if that person did exactly as he did. But even, even if someone didn't do that, if he was the only person in the world to have done that, it, come on. He, he's a hero. He sacrificed his life to save billions of people and his princess. So the, the false humility is really annoying. It kind of like gets on my nerves just a little bit. So there, there are a lot of things I could actually go into the, um, uh, the details. There, there are many more things that just made the book uh, very not hard to follow. Actually, it was an easy read, but it just, it just didn't, didn't feel right didn't feel right. So that is what I'm going to say. He's a Gary Stu, one-dimensional in that he has no arc. He's the same man from the beginning all the way to the end. The villains are not only one-dimensional evil, which is fine. Just be clever. I don't care about one-dimensional evil. I don't care about being evil for evil's sake. But be clever, especially if you're an advisor to a king of an entire planetary kingdom. Uh, they just you just have to be smart. You have to be calculating. And when I see that you're not, and you let the hero get away, I'm sorry, you're you're not a good villain at all. Um, so there was that, and on top of that, there was there was no um, you know inner space. There was no interiority. I I really couldn't get to know the main character personally, which which put me off because it's like I don't feel the stakes. He just goes from one big thing to the next really without changing, really without changing. And, and not only that, there's this, in, in, um, it's, it's very much incongruent, uh, or this incongruence, I should say, between having a pure noble heart and an innocent heart and having a very nefarious, illegal occupation of smuggling and being a mercenary but only killing out of self-defense. Yes, that, that actually happened. He did shoot out of self-defense. You know, for those of you who love Han Solo, Han shot first. This guy wanted he this writer wanted this guy to be as cool as Han Solo, but he did not want to shoot first. <laughs> so uh, there's that. So that is the first thing. Those are all the reasons why I give the story one out of star, one star out of five. I will say I give it the one star because it's a complete story. There's there's the beginning, the climax, and then also the resolution. So there's that, but that's all it had going for it. Um, so. More to say, but this video is getting long. I actually did want to talk about something with this. So basically, this book was written as paying homage to Star Wars. In fact, I think either the preface or the, the general synopsis of this book, I remember the writer saying that this was basically, this, this story was a reaction against Disney's treatment of Star Wars. And I would say, okay, that's that's good motivation. That's that's good enough motivation. You actually put your money where your mouth is and and wrote a book. That's that is so cool that you did that. And I think that is to be uh, recommended. That is commendable. Uh, but I would say that's not enough. That's not enough. It's not enough to write a book that that pays tribute to the old heroics, you know, that traditional old heroics, the old-fashioned heroics that involves the traditional masculine hero. All of that is very good, but it's still not reason enough to just have a story. It's, it's not enough to make a good story, I should say. And I really wish the writer 
considered getting an editor. I, I, I think he just self-published, which is great. But I just say, please, please, guys, get yourself an editor. Get yourself a very good editor that would help not just with grammatical things, but also content. You know, have the editor ask questions. Well, why is this so? What's missing here? All those things that an editor can pick up. And so I would say it's it's not enough to just want to write a story with old aspirational heroes even. You've got to write a good story. And this kind of brings me to this point that this is a kind of virtue signaling where you're so focused on, you know, uh, a, a, this kind of banter or this kind of counterattack, you know, against all the ideology and all the insidious agenda that, that has really just not just tainted, but also ruined all these franchises that we love. Yes, including Star Wars, but it's it, it would be your own agenda. It would be your own virtue signaling if you just stuck with male hero, no arc, no conflict. He's good at everything. And, and this is true, by the way, with, with female heroes. I'm not just sticking it to the guys, but but don't make your hero a Gary Stu. Even in the name of defeating Disney Star Wars, don't make your hero a Gary Stu. Make your hero um, able to undergo proper editorial treatment. And I think that's really important. We, we can be so fixated on being anti-something, so anti-Disney treatment of Star Wars, that, that we, we go to the extreme without, you know, fermenting and cultivating a proper story, a good story. So that's what I wanted to say with, with this review. You know, on top of this review is it's not enough to go back to the traditional masculine hero archetype. You got to make him good. You got to make him a very good character. You got to make his love interest very convincing. You got to make him struggle with stuff. Even if he's a competent fighter, for instance, maybe he's a competent fighter and pilot. You got to make him struggle with something else. You got to make him mess up. This guy never messed up. This guy never messed up. The villains didn't let him. And, and that's a problem. It's a problem to write stories in that way where it's like, nothing else matters. I just want old heroics. There's more to that. Because if you don't, if you don't have that purpose and you don't push your t you don't push yourself to write that archetypal story, that 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 hero's journey, but also well done, it's not gonna stick. And it's gonna it, 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 the culture will pass by it, not even picking it up. If you want something where, where the culture really understands it and, and grasps it and loves it and embraces it, you got to really know what to do in order to write a good story. So that's what I wanted to say. Thanks always for watching and listening. And until I see you next, keep producing, preserving, and promoting the good art that you love. And if you have something negative to say, maybe not reveal who the artist is. <laughs> and I will catch you later. Thanks again.